Several years ago, a young oncologist named Siddhartha Mukherjee undertook a daunting task to tackle the history of cancer. He aptly called it the emperor of all maladies, a phrase he borrowed from a 19th century surgeon. And cancer is just that. This year, there will be one point set, nearly 1.7 million new cancer cases diagnosed in this country, and nearly 600,000 people will die of the disease. Cancer accounts for nearly one in every four deaths. Its impact on our lives, on all of our lives, is profound. As Mukherjee put it, writing The Emperor of All Maladies was an attempt to enter the mind of this immortal disease, to understand its personality, and to demystify its behavior. Ken Burns then made a documentary based on the book, which helped amplify the important stories. In this clip, we step back in time and remember another era of treatment for breast cancer, a disease that affects one in eight women in this country. Let's watch. By 1970, nearly 40,000 American women were undergoing radical mastectomies every year. There seemed to be no alternative. Breast cancer was the only cancer that it was felt you had to do the biopsy and the definitive treatment within minutes of each other. You would go to surgery. The woman would have to sign a consent that said if it was found to be cancer, I would have a mastectomy right then and there. So you would go into the operating room and you wouldn't know whether you were going to wake up with a breast or not. And you know how you found out? You looked at the clock. If it was three hours, it was cancer. And if it was an hour, you were benign. It was just appalling. Today, the World Health Organization reported that breast cancer is killing more these days, a quarter of a million women a year. Despite the severity of the radical mastectomy, more than a third of patients relapsed. Yet few thought to question the operations. When they didn't work, instead of saying, hmm, maybe there's something wrong with this theory, they said, oh, we're just not cutting enough. And they would make it bigger and bigger. But actually, there was something wrong with the theory. It would take a determined surgeon from Pittsburgh named Bernard Fisher to finally question the scientific assumptions underlying the radical mastectomy. Fisher had been doing the operation for years, but it seemed little benefit to the women under his care. I began to think, well, we really don't know much about this disease we're treating. What, you know, why are we doing this? There was no basis in fact. Fisher had thought hard about how breast cancer actually spreads, or metastasizes, from one part of the body to another. Unlike most surgeons at the time, he doubted that cancer moves like a spreading stain around the original site of the tumor. Instead, Fisher suspected that stray cancer cells detach from the original tumor very early and migrate to far-flung sites in the body through the bloodstream or lymphatic system, where a surgeon's scalpel would never find them. I began to obtain information in the laboratory that there was no orderly pattern of tumor cell dissemination. The idea that breast cancer was a local or regional disease was not so. It was a systemic disease. That's what cancer was. If Fisher was right, it meant that the radical mastectomy was too much for the woman whose breast cancer had remained localized, and too little for the one whose cancer had already spread. Fisher resolved to test his theory with a full-scale clinical trial. He would divide breast cancer patients randomly into two groups, one which would undergo a radical mastectomy, and the other a much smaller operation called a lumpectomy, which removed the tumor but conserved the breast. The medical establishment was aghast. A randomized procedure in which the doctor himself and the patient had no control was totally a abominable to the conscience of the doctors at that time. When it's a choice between losing a breast and losing a life, I don't think there's much choice, really. The women who've had radical treatment have been fortunate, and there are likely to be more of them living at 10 years than there would be of the other group. They were absolutely out to destroy me and my ideas. It was totally antithetical to theirs. <laughs> 
He was the most hated surgeon in the history of mankind. His colleagues got to the Cancer Institute, took his grants away, it vilified him. I used to go to the meetings and, and sit and listen to them tear him apart. I sometimes wonder how he survived it. What struck me was he was a tough guy. Fisher responded to his critics with characteristic bluntness. In God we trust, he said, all others must have data. Breast cancer is a scientific problem. It is not an intellectual exercise or an emotional problem. And therefore, the data which determines what or what not should be done must be obtained and analyzed in a scientific way. But getting data was not easy. Most breast surgeons refused to refer their patients to Fisher's study. The people at the academic centers and the people that were really hardcore, they didn't change. They had put their whole life into this. And to say that they were wrong to themselves, I don't think they could admit it even to themselves. Fortunately for Fisher, breast cancer patients themselves had finally begun to question whether the radical mastectomy was worth the cost. The women by this time were getting wind of this. The women were the ones that were finding out maybe there was an alternative. And it was the women who really drove the change and the shift to breast conservation. Leading the charge was a tenacious science journalist named Rose Kushner. At the age of 45, Kushner had been told that she needed a radical mastectomy. She began researching the procedure and quickly discovered how little was known about the science on which it was based. No man is going to make another impotent while he's asleep without his permission, she wrote. But there's no hesitation if it's a woman's breast. She went to the medical meetings and she berated the surgeons and she was this little short woman yelling at them and they were all, you know, shaking in their boots. I think that today is the beginning of the end of mastectomy for the routine treatment of all, all breast cancer. Rallied by Kushner and others, breast cancer patients began flocking to Fisher's study. The trial comparing the radical mastectomy to the lumpectomy would take a decade, but when the results were finally released in 1985, they were unequivocal. We have a report about breast cancer this evening, which is a vital concern to virtually every woman. It concludes that women in whom the breast is removed do not live any longer than women in whom only the tumor is taken out. It didn't make a difference whether you amputated the whole breast or just took the tumor out of the breast. The survival was the same. It wasn't the amount of surgery. It was the kind of cancer that they had, and probably that some cancers got out before you got there, before the surgeon showed up. And so you could cut all you want, but the horse was out of the barn already. I think the major question for women who are watching this show is what does this mean for women with breast cancer? Radical mastectomy is now no longer a viable operation. Radical mastectomy is out. Fisher had overthrown one of the central dogmas in cancer therapy, that cutting more meant curing more. Although mastectomies remained common, the radical surgery pioneered by Halstead nearly disappeared. Almost as importantly, he had reminded the field of cancer medicine of the need to constantly challenge its own assumptions. What happens in medicine and in science is we come up with a story to explain our observations. And we get enamored of our story. And then we use that story to keep going on and it propels the research and it propels the kind of treatments you do. And it's really only when you just can't justify it anymore that we start to throw it out. But it lasts a long time, these stories. 